This is the fourth week in this teaching series, uh, Deeper Still, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to be reading in Acts chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. If you have a Bible, you can turn to it. Um, Jesus, Jesus speaking, and he's, it's before he's ascended, right after the passage we looked at last week, if you were here last week. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Which is more important? A deep, powerful experience of God's love or telling people about God's love? What's more important, a powerful prayer life or life of courageous mission? What's more important if you're a disciple, a follower of Jesus, God working in you or God working through you? We break ourselves oftentimes into personality types or certain denominations or traditions or families or whatever may prefer one or the other. We might have an implicit bias towards, oh, I just want to experience God or an implicit bias towards, oh, I want to work and do things for God. But the reality is it is not an either or, it's a both and. Throughout this teaching series, we've been looking at the Holy Spirit, and we've been inviting every one of you in the Anchor community, whether here at Central or Lincoln or Lakewood, to go deeper with the Holy Spirit. Let me just tell you that it doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus, there is still more in your future and in your journey with regards to your relationship to the Holy Spirit. You, no one in here has reached the end. No one in here has got the terminal degree in the Holy Spirit. There is still more. There is still deeper. And so uh, the first week we talked about walking by the Spirit. And the second week we talked about spiritual gifts. God has given every follower of Jesus spiritual gifts so that you might serve your community and serve your city and your neighbors. And last week, we talked about Pentecost. And, and specifically, we talked about living from consecration, a place of readiness and openness before God, saying that I am available and ready. Come do what you will in my life. And today we're talking about the both and, the both and of God working in us and God working through us. And in so doing, I hope we can break down the bias that some of us have towards one or the other and recognize that both, the invitation is to both, to live a life of God working in us and through us. We're going to be looking at verse 8 for this teaching, and I read it already. I want to look at it now and highlight the first part of this both and. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Jesus is saying this, but he's, he's saying it to the original disciples, the group of 120 that were waiting in expectation for Pentecost to happen, where the Holy Spirit would come down, as we talked about last week, like fire and like wind. But just because Jesus said it to the original 120 does not mean it's also not applicable to us. It is applicable to us. Every follower of Jesus has a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is good news. It's good news because it's, it means that God hasn't said, you're welcome for the forgiveness. Here's a book about me. Good luck with life. No. Jesus has, invite, has, has sent his Holy Spirit to fill, to guide, to empower that's what a lot of this teaching series is all about. Romans 8 
talks about the power of the Spirit. In fact, if you just want to pray through a passage in Scripture that has all these different applications of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 is a beautiful, powerful passage. There's this passage in there, verse 15, that talks about it's by the Spirit, through the Spirit, that we cry out, Abba, Father. And Abba meaning this intimate term of relationship with God, Father, Dad. And it's the Holy Spirit that does that in us, Paul says. So one of the evidences of the Holy Spirit working in us is are we growing in a deeper relationship with God? Are we realizing, believing, coming to believe that God does in fact love us? That's an evidence, an aspect, a glimpse of the Holy Spirit working in us. You, you might think, it is. You might just think it's, oh, I'm, I'm growing in my understanding. But Paul says, no, you are growing in your understanding because of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing that. The Holy Spirit gives gifts. We've mentioned that. Some of these gifts are miraculous gifts that it seems like there's no other explanation for because but the Holy Spirit. And some of these gifts seem like, okay, they, they actually seem like they're natural skills, but Paul says both of them, the seemingly, the obviously miraculous and the seemingly natural, are from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit helps and empowers us. The Holy Spirit is necessary. It's not an add-on. It's not auxiliary. It's necessary if we are to live the Jesus life. But how or when? Like, when does it happen? How does it happen? When does it happen? Many church leaders and theologians have tried to offer intricate theologies that offer all these different steps and stages through which we might come to understand when the baptism of the Spirit happens. Some have said, it's a second work. If you follow Jesus, say yes to Jesus, it's a second work. Some have said, it's a third work. Some have said, it's a fourth work. And I just say, it's a whole bunch of good people doing bad theology. Here's what we know from Scripture. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now, here's the, here's the one that really clarifies when the Holy Spirit begins to work in our life. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit. The language there of a seal is of the, what a king would use to, to uh, put his insignia on an important message. He would melt the wax and impress his insignia on the wax so when the wax hardened, it would be saying, this is the king's. Paul is saying that when the Holy Spirit melts our heart and the king impresses his insignia on it, it is as if we have been sealed. The king's message, his signature has been signed. It's been imposed on the, our melted heart and we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. When does it begin it happens at the beginning when we come to true and vital faith in Jesus and his death, his resurrection, and his continuing reign and work. But it isn't like it's there and good, we're done. Can you imagine in any other relationship, a marriage, for example, you get married and you're saying, okay, I'm great. We celebrated that ceremony. I'll go ahead and live at this address. You can live at this address. Maybe we'll bump into each other at Fred Meyer. It's not a great recipe for a healthy marriage. Paul is, is doesn't anticipate just because we're sealed with the Spirit, we don't have to interact and continue to grow with the Spirit. No, it's the beginning, the starting point, not the completion or the, or the termination. So he goes on, he says in Ephesians 5.18, the same book, the same letter he's writing to the church of Ephesus, which is in modern day Turkey. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now this is, in the Greek, 
this language of be continuously filled. Keep being filled. One person talked about the need to constantly be filled by the Spirit. And a critic said, why do you keep asking for constant filling? Don't you just believe by faith that you are filled? And he said, well, I would, but I leak. (laughs) And I don't know about you, the same is true for me. I leak. I need a continuous filling. Holy Spirit, would you fill me every morning? We can pray, Holy Spirit, would you fill me? I am sealed by the Spirit, but the work of being filled by the Spirit is an ongoing, everyday cry that we get to make before a God that is gracious and loves us. And sometimes, sometimes this filling of the Spirit in our life as we cry out for it shows up in a dramatic mystical, miraculous way. And some of the folks that make these intricate theologies, they look at their own life and they say, oh, I had a powerful moment after coming to faith. That must be true for everybody. And that's the mark that really can, people can really point to of like when you've had that powerful experience, then you have really been filled with the Spirit. Well, the reality is, is that I hope every one of you has multiple, countless, powerful, mystical, miraculous encounters with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing thing that we should cry out for. It shouldn't be, oh yes, I've made it through level two. No, it's let's ask for that all the time. And other times the Holy Spirit shows up in this faint whisper, this gentle small, thin voice. We may know the right decision, but we might be finding ourselves tempted away from the right decision. And the Holy Spirit comes as a still, small voice tapping us on the shoulder saying, remember who you are. Remember what will give you what you truly need and desire. That may not be the wow, oh my gosh, firework, Holy Spirit moment, but it is just as much a move of the Holy Spirit in your life. Don't put the Holy Spirit in a box. Don't say it's just the fireworks and miss out on the still small voice. And don't say it's just the still small voice and miss out on the fireworks. At Anchor, We want to let God be who he is as much whenever he wants. Think about any friendship you have. If you try to put the person in a box, you diminish their personhood. You shrink their humanity. When you put the Holy Spirit in a box and say, he can only show up as a still small voice, or he can only show up in the miraculous and the mystical, what happens then is you miss out on the whole picture of who the Holy Spirit is. I would even go farther. Sometimes the Holy Spirit shows up in total silence. Sometimes, and we learn this from the scriptures, we learn it from church history, that sometimes God takes away the experience, our felt experience of him for a season so that we learn to trust him even if there isn't the experience of him. The Holy Spirit will be who he is and he invites us to let him be who he is in the silence, in the still small voice, and in the miraculous and the mystical. There are lots of ways to grow in our relationship and our awareness of the Holy Spirit, but I think if you're like me, sometimes you know that it used to be like this. Uh, Now there's probably an app for it, but whenever I would go to the mall as a teenager, I'd have to look and find out where I was, right, on the map. Sometimes if you ask me, where are you with the Holy Spirit at certain stages of my life, I wouldn't know what to answer. 
I wouldn't be able to point to something. And I think that's true for all of us. In fact, it's probably true for lots of our relationships. I don't right know where I am with that person. And so I want to offer you kind of a way to begin to re-engage with where you are at and in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's a very simple three-part prayer. And it begins like this. Holy Spirit, search me. Holy Spirit, search me. You might not know where you are with the Holy Spirit, but when you, with an open heart, maybe a journal open, begin your prayer saying, Holy Spirit, search me. What happens is, is that the Holy Spirit will come and sometimes maybe like a spotlight, start to kind of look around and point to certain things in your life. And sometimes those things are areas of brokenness. Areas where we had surrendered it to God at one point, but then our own brokenness creeped back in and started to take control again. And other times the Holy Spirit will shine the light, not on brokenness, but on blessing in our life. I think some of us as followers of Jesus naturally expect it always, the Holy Spirit to always shine a light on our sin when we say, search me. But it's not always the case. Sometimes the Holy Spirit shines a light on the areas where he's gifted you and you just haven't dared to believe that he might in fact be gifting you there. An area of leadership he's calling you to. An area of service he's calling you to. A friendship that, that, that maybe that you can be a unique blessing to that no one else can. But it begins, whether the Holy Spirit points to brokenness or blessing or both, it begins with the simple prayer. You don't have to master a theological dictionary. It's just a simple prayer. Search me, Holy Spirit. And then... The second part of the prayer is, Holy Spirit, help me. I don't know about you, but I've tried to do the Jesus stuff with my own strength, and it's left me exhausted or arrogant, depending on the season and time of my life. We need the helper, the Holy Spirit, to help us. In fact, in John 14 and 16, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the helper. The Greek word is paraclete. It comes from these two basic words. Para means to come alongside. And kaleo means to call. The Holy Spirit is the helper, the one that comes next to you and calls you deeper. Search me. Help me. When we ask for the Holy Spirit to help me, he empowers us to do the Jesus life with the source of strength that Jesus had. Help me. Pull up alongside me and call me to what you've invited me towards. Search me, help me, fill me. Fill me. God, would you come? I surrender. I raise the white flag. I am yours. There are, is nothing in me that will resist you. Holy Spirit, fill me. This simple three-part prayer, search me, help me, fill me, can be a daily prayer. Maybe twice daily, three times daily. If I'm honest and candid, I could take four or five myself. But I think if we at Anchor begin praying this prayer, we won't or we will be able to answer the question, where are you in your relationship with the Holy Spirit? Just on this, uh, you know, we use these connection cards. Um, and, you know, if this, lots of times we can kind of get confused with regards to the Holy Spirit. So I, I just, if you want somebody to pray with you about being filled with the Spirit or or finding out where you are on your relationship with the Holy Spirit, I just invite you to just kind of write that down and one of our pastoral staff will reach out to you. We can, over the phone, we can pray with you. We can walk with you and talk with you. We would love to partner with you and what God is doing in your life so that we all have a sense 
of what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life and in our community in our neighborhoods. It's important work, and we are here for you along this journey. I would just add, too, it also says there, uh, maybe you've seen it if you've looked at the connection card, I want to follow Jesus. If you're here and you're like, okay, I've been coming. I don't know where I am with Jesus, let alone the Holy Spirit. We, again, would love to partner and have a conversation with you about what it looks like to begin a journey with Jesus. But I mentioned that this is a both and, right? Both what God is doing in us, but then and what God wants to do through us. So we see this in the second part of this verse. Verse 8 says, again, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, when I was a young follower of Jesus, I was a senior in high school, tail end of senior in high school, freshman year of college. You know, if you followed Jesus and you're not from, the, if you didn't grow up in the church and all of a sudden you, you find out that, that God loves you and that he has given himself for you and all the things that, that you've done, the boneheaded decisions, the sins, the, all that, it's not counted against you because what Christ has offered you. If, if you find that out, like at midlife or as a teenager, all of a sudden you're, you're sent into the community and a lot of times it feels like the community has all these words and you don't know any of them. They're using kind of Christian code. And so one of the Christian code words that I started to hear when I was a follower, early young follower of Jesus was this term witnessing. And some people in the church, they would say, I'm going out witnessing. And I had no idea what that meant, but I would just nod my head and say, sounds good, you know. Well, what I found out was that when people said, I'm going witnessing, they meant that they were going, telling, going to tell people about Jesus' love, about God's love. But it's interesting when you look at this passage, Jesus does not, and nowhere in scripture does it, use their idea of witnessing as a verb. Witness in scripture is not a thing to do or not do, but it is a noun. It is a person to be, not a thing to do. Now the problem with witnessing as a verb it compartmentalizes the spiritual into a certain part of our life that doesn't demand everything. So I can go out witnessing and then I can go out lying, technically. <laughs> Jesus actually asks for a little bit more, like a lot more your whole life. To be a witness means that I've witnessed with my life the mercy and grace of God. And it has transformed my whole life, all of my life. And so to live as a witness affects not just part of my life, but all of my life. Even beyond just the message of Jesus, or rather the message of Jesus gets proclaimed with how I live and love my neighbors, not just how I talk with my neighbors. It's a comprehensive, holistic invitation to live life on holistic mission with word and deed throughout all of our life. This, we're getting a glimpse of the both and with the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus is not saying, yeah, you're going to have a radical experience with the Holy Spirit and then you'll find, you know, then go tell everybody. He's saying the Holy Spirit will send you out to tell people, to love, to serve, to give. It's God working in you. It's God working through you. It's not a private, individualistic, mystical experience. It's a powerful experience of the Holy Spirit that is catalytic, that sends you out towards the frontiers. When you look at the book of Acts, Jesus gives us the table of contents right there at the beginning. You could say Jesus invented the idea of the table of contents. Because it says, Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. 
And if you want to know what the rest of the book of Acts is about, is it's about this Jesus movement going out to Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And why that's important is because we see the Holy Spirit shines that spotlight on whoever is willing to go to the frontiers. And everybody that's not willing to go to the frontiers <laughs> gets kind of forgotten as the Holy Spirit keeps moving or panning the camera towards the ones willing to go to the frontiers. For those of you that know the book of Acts well, it's why it shifts from Peter to Paul at one point. Because the Holy Spirit is moving towards the frontiers. If you want to know where God is working or what God is inviting you to, ask yourself, where are the frontiers in my life? Where are the places where you would say, surely God couldn't do something there? And the second you've answered that question is the second you've identified where the frontier is. And if you want to see the Holy Spirit move, start showing up in that place. How do you show up? That's important. Many a Christian have got it wrong. You show up with blessing. And because I'm a pastor, I have an acrostic for you. Bless. When you identify the frontiers, you bless. And this is, uh, we don't have it on the screen, so I know it'll be difficult. You have to remember it or write it down here. B, begin with prayer. Begin with prayer. Holy Spirit, speak to me, guide me, give me strength. You might even start with that three-part prayer. Search me, help me, fill me. Then listen well. When you look at Jesus' interactions with people, all sorts of people, oftentimes he does a lot of listening. We think of him as a teacher, and he was. But one way he teaches us was when we see how he listens as well. Begin with prayer, listen well, then eat together. Jesus, again, models this type of fellowship around a table where he dines with people that the religious folk kept on pushing aside. Begin with prayer, listen well, eat together, serve regularly. Demonstrate your identity as a servant by serving those on the frontier. And then next, share God's love. When you identify the frontier, show up and bless the people on the frontier. Bless them. Begin with prayer, listen well, eat together, serve and share God's love. When you see these two things together, the powerful work of God in you and the work of God through you, you get what we call at Anchor the burning center and the expanding edge. Both are works that the Spirit is very concerned with and interested in. The burning center and the expanding edge. That's why at Anchor, when we started Anchor, we didn't just want to say, okay, good, we did a church. We started a church. God opened doors. It's great. All right. We wanted to ask the question, no, where, where is the edge? How can we continue to find the edge? That's why we plant churches. Because we think more churches gives more people access to Jesus. That doesn't mean that the churches, that any other, that there's so many churches doing so many great things, but still, more churches means more places that are giving access to Jesus. The burning center and the expanding edge. Any movement has both of these qualities. It's something that God has woven into creation, that anything that goes forward past a generation has a burning center and an expanding edge. And it is most clearly seen throughout the history of the church. The people that have felt the power and the hungered for the power, the fire of God, have been the ones on the frontiers working God with, that God works through. 
If you try to do one or the other, if you just have the burning center but no expanding edge, your spiritual life becomes self-involved and indulgent. You just hunger for experience. And if you just have the expanding edge without the burning center, you wonder, why am I even doing here? And you lose track of what has called you there in the first place. We need both. Paul, writing to a church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica, said, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You see this picture of the Holy Spirit there. Not just words, but power on the frontier. God is calling us to know that we're loved. Holy Spirit, search me. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, fill me. The band can come up. Um, and again, if, you, if you're interested in getting prayer from anybody on our pastoral staff to grow in your relationship with the Holy Spirit, you can just fill this out and put them in the giving stations or bring it to the connection counter and somebody will contact you. There's this song, this old Christian hymn, that I've kind of almost make a prayer for myself at certain stages. And maybe you remember it. If you grew up in the church, maybe you've heard it. Um, begins, I've got a river of life flowing out of me. It makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. It opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. What's my prayer that anchor, you would know the invitation is that you would have a river of life flowing out of you. You, you, you didn't start. You, it's not the headwaters didn't begin in you. They began in the heart of God. And he pours out his living water in us. I've got a river of life. It heals everything in me. It cleanses everything in me. It purifies all the stuff that's broken, all the idols, all the unsurrendered parts of my life. That river of life, it comes, it cleanses. I've got a river of life, but it doesn't stop with me. It's coming out of me. It sets the lame to walk, the blind to see. It finds the frontiers. It opens prison doors. It sets the captives free. Oh God, that you might do a work in anchor, that there might be this torrent of water flowing out of us, flowing out of this place. You're invited for prayer at both sides of the auditorium. You might come and just say, hey, I need that Holy Spirit prayer. Help me remember it. I can't really remember it. You might say, I want a river of life too flowing out of me. But come. And then come to the table. It's bountiful. There's enough for all. And when you come, you'll hear Christ's body given for you, Christ's blood shed for you. The Holy Spirit wants to work in you and through you.